Good morning, I'm Sophie Rovner. Welcome to this news briefing from the 254th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society here in Washington, DC. We're joined today by Dr. Rebecca Lahr from Michigan State University. She's developing a low-cost method to analyze top tap water using the coffee ring effect. Dr. Lahr? Thank you. Yes, I'm Rebecca Lahr from Michigan State University and I am working to harness the coffee ring effect for tap water monitoring. And so tap water testing, it can be expensive, it can require specialized equipment, uh, and so we're trying to develop a low-cost way that, that anyone anywhere in the world can look at what's in their tap water. And so what do we do? Well, harness the coffee ring effect. So uh, we have a slide here. We, we take a droplet of water, so very small droplet, about two microliters. We place that droplet on a solid surface and then we let it dry without wiggling it. And so by doing that, we can harness the coffee ring effect, we let all the water evaporate away, and we look at the residue that's remaining after it dries. And so when we, when we do that, we find that the residue pattern from each tap water, from every tap water, uh, is unique. So we get a fingerprint of that tap water based on the residue that's remaining after the water evaporates away. And so these patterns are intricate. It's quite interesting to see how, how different they could be. Um, but it all makes sense when you think about the chemistry behind it. The chemistry and the physics is, is um, pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, so the coffee ring effect is what we're looking at here. And so when you put a droplet of solution on a slide, um, the edges of that droplet will, will get pinned to the surface. If you watch a water droplet dry over time, you'll notice that the droplet doesn't shrink in diameter, but it shrinks in height. So it's shrinking in height, and so those edges are pinned. So in order for that to happen, water from the inside of the drop must move to the outside of the drop. So water's moving from the inside to the outside of the drop, and that's moving particles. If you have particles in your solution, it's gonna move those particles from the inside to the drop edge. And then as your water um, droplet, if you have a water droplet on your table and it's evaporating over time, the angle between the substrate and that, the, the water, the water air interface, is gonna decrease over time. And that angle changing squishes particles into place based on size. And so for tap water, you know, we have some particles in the beginning, but you know, in, in, in Michigan we have um, groundwater. You know, it's, it's very hard groundwater. So we have lots of ions in our, in our groundwater. And so um, these ions form particles as that water sample dries, you're forming your particles. And so you, you get these patterns because um, you, you have um, your particles moving around in your, in your droplet, you have different types of salt forming different types of particles over time, and so you get intricate patterns through this. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to harness this to be able to um, monitor water quality. Um, and we're also using this as a tool that we can use in science classrooms to help students learn more about their tap water. So I can have students bring in any aqueous solution that they're interested in into my, in my chemistry class. So they could bring in tap water, they could bring in surface water, you know, a beverage that they, they drink regularly, and then we can look at the patterns and see um, some information about the composition. So we're really trying to harness this. We've got a long way to go with the research, but um, we're working hard to harness this phenomenon for something that we can, we can use, something that could be used as a low-cost monitoring tool. And so uh, the, this image here is just a few different patterns. So the, the fingerprints we're looking at here for different types of waters, you know, you see different crystals in those, in those different patterns um, based on the water chemistry. Do you want to say anything more about that? Mm -hmm. okay. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions? And if so, please state your name and affiliation before you ask your question. Hi, so it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I wonder, is this method quantifiable at all? Can you actually tell how much of something might be in there? So we're still working on many of the details of this method. Um, let's see. So we're working to correlate features in the image to concentration. So looking at when the particle, if, if the particle count changes, so we can quantify that, you know, using ImageJ software, you can count how many particles you have. Uh, and, and then you can, you can look for correlations between particle count and your concentration. You can look for correlations um, between um, the amount of material, so, so the general coverage on the, on the slide and your concentration. Uh, so, you know, it, it really depends on the solution. So if, if you put in um, 
different concentrations of something like iron chloride, you'll get a different result than if you put in something like copper chloride. So it's specific to each component, and we're working on the quantification. I understand as well that you're compiling a library um, of different water coffee rings. Um, is that from different areas? I was wondering maybe how consumers might be able to test whether their own water uh, in future is um, you know, safe or the quality of their own water just by judging their coffee ring against the standard, if you like, what it, sh what it should look like. Mm -hmm. So again, we're working on a few different avenues for this. Uh, one way is to just create a library and have you know, comparison of your image to the library. Um, but another way that we're you know, envisioning for the future is to, to look at these uh, and identify them kind of like a tree identification guide, right? Where you look for a certain feature and that tells you you might have one type of water. Um, and then you look for a second feature and it, ha you know, it tells you that you have something else in your water. Um, but also l using computer modeling. So a user could just put this into a database and, um, and that will help them determine the concentrations of things. So we have a long way to go on this, right? We're, we're very, very um, new in this research. Uh, it looks promising, but we have a long way to go with, with that. Uh, so I'm Emma Stoy from Chemistry World magazine. Um, I understand you can tell things like how much of the um, particles uh, are in the droplet and kind of where they've ended up. To what extent can you actually identify what they might be if, if you don't actually know what's in there? Because obviously a sample of sort of tap water or pond water or something might have tons of stuff in there. And can you actually use this method to sort of like give you more of a detailed look at what's going on? So if we think about the solubilities of different particles, something like calcium carbonate is, is not very soluble. And so as the water droplet dries, you should be forming calcium carbonate particles pretty early in the drying process. And those particles, they'll look, you know, calcium carbonate forms ter certain types of, of crystals, right? And so based on where you see the crystals, and based on their shapes and sizes, you can get a sense of, uh, you know, what, where different, what different things are. So something like sodium chloride, you know, that is very soluble. So that hangs out in solution. The sodium and the chloride ions hang out in solution much longer. And so then your um, droplets drying, um, your water is evaporating away, and those, those ions will still be in solution when you are starting to lose the, that flow pattern of delivering those particles to the edge. And so you'll, you'll see things that are less soluble, you, sh you should, uh, sorry, things that are more soluble, you sh should see them across the center of the drop rather than on the edge. And so we can use shapes, we can use sizes, um, we can use positions to help us get at some of these things. And just quickly, what are you actually using to analyze it? Is it literally just you take a picture of it with a, with a camera and then I guess you're using software to try and pick out trends and stuff? So there's a, a few different ways we could look at it. We could look at it with a microscope, right? Um, but what we're actually doing is we're using this jeweler's loop here. So this provides 30x magnification uh, and you can get all sorts of different types of jeweler's loops. Um, it's got a light on it and a UV light, so you could even do a fluorescence with this. But we turn on the light, um, we put this on our slide with our, our residue pattern, our residue on it, and we put our cell phone camera right on top. Okay. So we snap a picture with our cell phone camera. Um, and so um, using all, all the images that you've seen up here, we've collected um, with a um, cell phone camera and with this jeweler's loop. So um, all of these images you, you see here are with, through the loop with the cell phone camera. Uh, ben Valsler, also Chemistry World. Uh, how consistent are the droplets for, uh, from the same water source from one drop to the next? So they are very consistent. The, the slide itself we're using is a very low cost material. Um, we buy a, a sheet, we cut it up. Very, very, very low cost. Uh, and, and so it's not always identical from you know, one batch to the next. Um, uh, and, and you, can, you can quantify that to some, to some degree. Um, but if, if you take the same water sample and you test it multiple times, we see the same features. If you take a water sample from two different places in the distribution system, you know, we're seeing similar patterns. Uh, if you take two water samples from different, um, different cities that have similar treatment, you see, you know, so, so we, we are seeing um, some, some uh, 
similarities in the drops for, for each one, right? So if we didn't see consistency, then this would be useless, right? So I wouldn't be here today. And how is the formation of the patterns affected by things like your choice of substrate, temperature, humidity, and, and those external factors? Mm -hmm. So the substrate does have to be smooth, right? Uh, and then if it's more hydrophobic, then you'll get a larger bead. You know, there have been others that have shown that if it's, if it's super hydrophobic, you actually, you don't get pinning of the drop edge. And so then you're, you'll get very different patterns because everything just condenses into one little spot, right? And so um, just, you know, uh, your average hydrophobic surface will form a droplet and the edges will stay pinned. Um, but it, it does have to be a very smooth substrate. You know, we want something that allows us to see it through this loop with our camera. Uh, and, and so it, it is sensitive to some of those types of things. Um, let's see, temperature and humidity, they also do influence the patterns. And there have been others who have done um, research to show that if you try to speed up the droplet drying, then you can actually um, make it too fast where you don't get the coffering effect anymore. Um, so if you add heat, you try to speed it up, you know, then, then you'll, you'll change that. And some particles take longer to form than others. And, and so um, temperature and humidity, they do influence it. And so you know, that's something that you, you can control, right? So we'll have to control for that. Thank you. Lauren Resch, American Chemical Society. Have you seen any impact in, let's say, urgency or demand since we've been having things like the Flint water crisis and these types of events around the United States lately? So we've, it, we've been working, I've been working, many others have been working on developing lower cost technologies for water monitoring for quite some time. Uh, and of, of course, when um, things like this happen, um, when we have um, problems in our water systems, you know, we, we always want to have our tests ready faster and sooner to, to help out with some of those types of things. Um, you know, but it's, it's, always, it's always been an issue, you know, wa water quality has been an issue throughout, you know, throughout time. Uh, and, and so, you know, maybe what we're looking for changes, um, but it, you know, it's always been an issue. We always have wanted lower cost ways, faster ways to look at things. You know, in the research lab, when we set up a study, we, we're limited by what we can look at, you know, based on time and money, right? And so if we can see more things faster, then we can, you know, we, we have more data points, you know, we can, we can go a lot further with what we've got. So yes, to some degree, um, you know, but we've been working on these types of things for, for some time. But yes, I do hope that we can, you know, have these tools to, to find those problems, find problems sooner, you know, to give people a tool that they can use to, uh, to find those problems themselves, um, rather than just having to use, you know, a, a paper s a test strip, you know, that you can put in your water sample and get a color. You have to know what you're looking at, what you're looking for in order to use those, those tools. You have to know you're looking, you're looking for lead and go out and buy your lead kit, right? Uh, and so if we can have more um, methods that can, you know, fingerprint a sample, ideally, in the ideal world, more and more of these tests where you can, you don't have to know exactly what you're looking at, then in theory, we can find more of these problems faster. And also, I think it's, it's really important to involve, um, involve more people in the water testing and, and do more um, tap water education, you know, in our, um, in science classrooms, so that um, people understand water a little better and know what to do if you have these types of things going on. Question in the back of the room. So uh, we have an online question from Christine Sa, American Chemical Society. She's asking uh, where the idea came from to use the coffee ring effect to analyze water. So I've been using the coffee ring effect um, to analyze water solutions for some time um, using Raman spectroscopy. So we would look at these droplets and we take chemical information across the surface. So we take thousands of Raman spectra across the surface and then we analyze that and get more information out. And we've been doing that. I, I worked on um, developing a test for cyanotoxin monitoring um, when I was at Virginia Tech um, where we did that. So we, we had solutions containing cyanotoxins and we would um, put them on our, our slide and the um, cyanotoxin would actually act like a particle it would end up on the edge of the drop, and then we could, it would be concentrated there, and we could actually um, quantify it with Raman spectroscopy. You can't necessarily, it's, it's much more challenging to look at it in solution because the concentration is, is lower, but if you concentrate it on the drop edge, 
then it's concentrated, you could see it by Raman spectroscopy. And so as I was doing that work, I've done all sorts of different solutions um, using the Raman spectroscopy, and, and uh, you see intricate patterns every time, and I always wondered exactly what is causing all of that. You know, each, each solution seems so unique. Why? Uh, and and it, it was just so sensitive, right? I've, I've looked at water samples, you know, extracts from solid phase extraction and other things, um, river water, tap water, you know, blood. Um, some of, um, of my favorite papers in this area are from human tear fluid and, and knee joint fluid, and, and all the patterns, they're, they're unique. And so uh, the more I looked at tap water samples, the more I realized that, you know, it's, it's controlled by the water chemistry. And so we might be able to harness that. And we might not even need the Raman spectrometer, right? We bought a portable Raman so that we could do this cheaper when we need the chemical analysis. But if we can, if we can get information just straight out of the pictures, whew, that's much cheaper. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACSLive underscore DC. Please join us for our final press conference at 11 a.m. today on what scientists learned from entering the tiniest monster truck in the world's first nano race. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>